So here I am again, I know. <laughs> so I'll be covering a little bit Kura and I'll try to only show the things that are different from the other ones that you've already seen so we can go to the coffee break without having a long delay. And if you have any questions or curiosities about other things that I haven't covered, you can find us here up till the midnight and over. So <laughs> you will have plenty of occasions. So Kura is a software that has been uh, produced for the Ultimaker, those two <coughs> machines that are back there. And uh, it's uh, the most, uh, I can say, safer choice if you have this kind of machine because it's been built for his particular needs and uh, sizes and everything and so you can be almost not certain but you can be kind of safe that you will have a good result when using it on an Ultimaker. It's also used for the other RepRap machines. So the interface it's a little bit in between the Makerware that um, Daniel was explaining just now and the other more complicated ones that have a lot more options. You can go with uh, a quick print and then you can almost have uh, almost nothing to choose, high quality, medium or low quality, and then the thin walled vase. You can choose the type of filament, the diameter of the filament, and this is all, if you want to support structure or not. And it's a little bit too limited this, but if you're particularly afraid of having to tweak things, you can also go for this one. Otherwise, you can go to the full settings, and in the full settings, you've got the basic settings that Daniel almost covered all of them together with Carlo before. You've got the layer height, and it's the same as the one you told us before. Here, you don't have the shells, but you have a wall thickness that it's a little bit more immediate to understand because the shells, you have to think how um, how big a shell is and how many you want and do the math in your head and decide what the wall thickness will be. Here you just put in millimeters what the wall thickness you want. So it's a little bit more immediate. Very nice the thing that if you stop near one of the various menus you've got some kind of a help. It just tells you at least what are the the normal values that you would like, then you can do whatever you want. And also, if you go and write something that it's not acceptable, it tells you right away, putting a big red box, so you already see that you're doing something wrong. Uh, most of these we've already seen, the fill density that you've seen also on the cardboard board there, the, the speed. On the Ultimark there's also the possibility, very very easy with a small uh, screw, to change the speed while it's printing. And this is very nice because sometimes you've got a print that it has a part that it's very easy, that doesn't have a complexity and you can go right ahead with a higher speed. And then when you get to the details, like for the beginning we were talking about the hand, when you're doing the wrist of the hand it's normal because it just has to do circles. When it reaches the fingers it has to stop on every finger and then start again on the next finger. So it could be a good idea if you're there and you're checking it to lower the speed when you get to some more difficult parts. So the printing temperature, we've already covered it. The support and the raft, as Anes was telling before, the diameter and the package density are particular of the kind of filament you use. So it's always a good idea to check your filament before, try the various sizes on various places because it's not so uh, homogeneous like you would want it to, and then get the right setting. You could almost always be content with checking the basic functions without getting crazy at going on with the advanced. Some of the advanced ones can be interesting to change, but as Daniel was telling you, you've got the retraction, again more different uh, settings for the speeds, uh, what the, um, the, the quality, the, the, the skirt, uh, that it's the, the, um, the, it does some kind of a round figure at the beginning, before starting your object, it will start doing some skirts all around it and you can decide to do one or more of these. Usually the skirt is useful because because the um, plastic will go down in the nozzle and then the flow will be more um, homogeneous, more uh will flow better. So putting one or more skirts also gives you the time to look at it and see if everything is going all right. It's also a very good thing, sorry for the interruption. No, go ahead. <laughs> when printing, uh, uh, mostly when printing with PLA, the plastic that is in the, in the nozzle mm -hmm. is not good, it's uh, already burned. So if you start printing with that, uh, then you're gonna have a burnt uh, piece of plastic in your piece. It's not gonna stick well. But when you have the skirt uh, settings, uh, that you, that starts to purge uh, this uh, bad plastic from the nozzle, and then you can start uh, to print a nice. 
so it could be a good idea to put more than one skirt just to check if things are going all right and be there and check everything so for uploading your for putting yourself your files inside of uh, Cura you just drag them not in the window unluckily but you can drag them on the small uh, icon that it's in the bottom in my case in the bottom of the screen or otherwise you can obviously as always load them with file load model I was showing you this one because it's a very nice and complicated piece that I've been uh, proposed yesterday as an impossible print but to show you the different kinds of views that Cura gives you the possibility to have this is the standard view but you can also have a transparent one that makes you see the various pieces of your object right through it and then there is a very interesting overhang that gives you an idea of what the problems will be when you will start printing it so it colors it in red so you can already see churning your model that there are a lot of things that will give problems in this kind of print pieces that are hanging over nothing or pieces that are very steep the angle is too steep and so on so it's a good idea to have a look at the various uh, possibilities another thing that Cura also does for you is show you the errors in the mesh I'll show you another one here it is because this mesh was perfect I'll scale this down because obviously the, the sizes frequently are a bit crazy when you import your objects because uh, not all the, um, the graphical 3D graphical um, softwares give the possibility to make to give uh, a size in centimeters or in one kind of metric unit or any kind of unit. So when you put them on the platform of your machine, it goes crazy and makes it incredibly big or incredibly small. So it's always uh, a little bit difficult to find the right size. So this is a um, a mathematical structure by the way it's the one I'm wearing right now and in some of the views in Cura you can see right away that there are some difficulties and some problems this is a hole in the mesh and you can also see it in the x-ray I don't know if it's oh well yes you can see it also on the screen it's a little bit dark unluckily but you can see right away that there are some holes in the mesh so up to you can just uh, go back to NetFab and MeshLab and try to correct them even though I have to say that this object in particular printed out without any problems on the Ultimaker even though there were these very small uh, holes in the mesh while sending it to shape files it went back because it wasn't shape waste pardon it wasn't possible to print it. This is why I can't show it to you unluckily in metal as I wanted to because uh, they took two weeks to think about it and then tell us that it was impossible to print it. <laughs> so we uploaded it again after correcting it and it will come unluckily after the, the workshop. So other uh, very easy and very immediate things that you can do is obviously rotate the object. It gives you the free axis one, two and three. You just choose one and you've got the angles and you can rotate your object. You can try to lay it flat but it doesn't really work that well. You can change its, uh, its angle. You can scale it very easily. You've got a percentage from the in comparison to the whole object or you've got a scale in millimeters and then you can mirror it also but also it's not particularly useful because usually it mirrors it in a specular way so it doesn't give you much more of a help I wanted to show you also the slicing but we'll use a smaller object otherwise we'll stay here for 10 minutes just to wait for it to slice and uh, I had uh, this one it's uh, one of the mathematical function that Professor Oliver was showing to us yesterday morning that we've been printing for him yesterday night through the night <laughs> so this is a cone you can see it on the bed so you have an idea of what the size of it will be you can do it a little bit bigger two times here it is so you check all your various um, 
uh, boxes with all the information that we've already covered here, so the layer height, wall thickness and so on. There are also other expert settings up here that you can check. Usually they are typical of your machine, so they're not, it's not uh, needed to change them every time you do a print. But for some kinds of particular kinds of prints, it could be useful to change the fan speed because you want more air pumping on it so it will cool uh, much more quicker and so on. Usually you won't change them so much, these ones. You can choose the infill here again and you can choose the Joris. I'll show you a video of that because it's particularly nice. And here you can choose also the support structure and the raft. No, not for this one. I'll show the Joris afterwards. When you've got everything... I know I can do print it. I wanted to show just this. So you, as we already told you, it's a good idea to have the object lay as flat as possible on the surface. I'm putting it in this position just to show you the raft and the support structure. So we'll go with prepare. This is a very fast object and it shouldn't take more than... Here you can see the bar down, the number of uh, layers that it will have to build and the bar moving on. Ta -ta -ta. And the bar stopping, no. <laughs> so here we are. I wanted to show it in this position because you can see the support structure in a different color w in comparison <coughs> to the object. You can move with the layers and see how the object is being built from the raft on. And you can have an idea of how the support structure will be made to support the object. I have to say that it's a strange support structure that he decided I would have placed something here probably more than there. But the, uh, the software does it by itself. You can't choose. So if you are good at drawing, it's better if you draw your own support structure for strange objects or obviously choose to lay them as flat as possible. I've got still, well, I don't have still five minutes, but I'll take five minutes to show you just another thing. The project planner, it's particularly interesting in Cura. It gives you the possibility to load more files with the add model. As these, for example, are the ones that we were printing for Professor Oliver yesterday. You just open all the files and the software will place them on the platform and then you can just Cut the, you can just create a single STL file with all your single objects together. So it's very convenient if you've got many small pieces that you want to, to paint in one go without getting crazy and having to print them every time one by one. You just export it as a single STL file and then change all the code and all the different things that you need. You can also choose to print one object at a time. So the printer will start doing the first object, then move to the second one, finish the second one and so on or just do them all together so the first layer of all the objects the second layer of all the objects and so on in this picture we tried doing it I'll show you just a picture this is the famous uh, cube the geared cube that was going around uh, yesterday and everybody's seen it's there so here you see the center of the cube and one of the gears and in the next picture you see the three pieces of the gear and the pins that are being printed. So it's very convenient if you've got small pieces, all the same kind of piece or various kinds of them that you want to print all together and uh, to don't waste too much time. And yes, the uh, one more reason for printing them once, one at a time. The first is it's quicker because there's less movement for each layer, just move from one object to the other. But the second one is that you have less, uh, say, filaments spread between the objects because when it moves there is still a little bit of plastic it's to make strings that connect all together and then you will have to clean so it's not particularly nice having to clean so to do the less post-processing possible but <laughs> it's uh, more complex for the slicer software to do that because uh, it has to uh, place the objects far away in order not to interfere with, with the extruder because when it's printing an object there's another object already built to the platform that is high enough uh, is may be a big source of trouble so uh, it, it has to place them automatically well far away and yeah, it has to know the, the size of the extruder and all the, all the parts around that may interfere with it. 
Here I've been adding more objects of the same kind and now he's placing them in red color because he's telling me that it's too much to ask if I want each of them to be printed by itself. If I want them all at once, he just puts them close together because it doesn't need so much space around and so I can put more pieces. It all depends on what are your, your needs and so on. So you, see, you can just add them and print uh, 20 small uh, objects all together in one go. And then I just show you one last thing that it's uh, that I didn't find in, uh, in the other slicers and softwares, but certainly somebody will correct me if, it's, if I'm wrong. That is the jo Joris option, and it's right here in the expert settings. Enable Joris the outer edge. This is used for these kinds of vases that are very or anyhow, objects that have just one layer of uh, thickness, so particularly light with translucent plastic, by the way. And uh, if you print them normally, thanks. If you print all these objects with um, the normal way of printing, the head will stop in the same place and move on to the next layer and you will see this kind of line that, that uh, on the side of the, the, of the object. You can also randomize the place where the head moves on the next layer and this is what we've done, we've done with this one, but you can still see here on the side mostly, you can still see where the junction was, where the head was moving. When you use these thin walled vases, you can use this other kind of option and the head of the printer will not, uh, here we go, it will go up in a spiral way. So it won't stop and then uh, it won't stop and go up one layer on the z-axis, but it will just go on in a spiral fashion and you won't see this kind of um, step. Sub, sub, yes, step in the object. And I didn't find it in the other slicers, but they will certainly tell me if I didn't find it because it's called with another name or not. They are talking about it and I'll have an answer after, after probably. <laughs> Is there also a slicer? Then I didn't find it. Uh, no, I'm going to do that shortly. Okay, it will be a slicer next week. <laughs> <laughs> it's a quick hack, actually. You can search and replace the G code file to make the. the okay, slicer. it's not. It's over my possibilities to do it in the G code. So I hope that you will add it in the yeah, in slicer because. Really I find it a nice option. So this is, I think, the major differences between the, the options that's, that Kura gives you. And for all the other questions, uh, go ahead and ask us and go for the coffee break. No, 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 no we don't. You can't go for the coffee you break. Really, really go after the coffee break. I want just to show you uh, very briefly the very last things before saying uh, bye bye for today. Of course, you're invited to come in the lab and do the slicing for yourself at uh, the time you like. But uh, just uh, um, briefly, I want to show you very, very quickly the very last uh, uh, software we can use. It's called Repetier Host. Uh, so what you do <coughs> is you can either control the printer, you can load STL files, you can slice them through an external slicing software, uh, all in with one interface. That is quite nice. Uh, so let me reshape the window. Okay. So uh, what I can do is I can add my file, uh, STL, here. I can do the usual uh, transformation, scale it, uh, do whatever is needed, translate, rotate uh, in different, uh, uh, with different um, uh, axes if I like. I can add multiple places, auto positioning them, uh, lay them flat on the platform, um, and that's the, that's the standard things. Then I move to the second uh, tab here. I can slice them with uh, either Skinforge or Slicer. I will use Slicer. Uh, you, you cannot choose all the parameters here from this interface, but you can choose the um, preset that Slicer allow you to <coughs> create. So uh, you have to have configured Slicer before, so I open Slicer. I can configure my printer settings here. I can configure my filament settings. With a, I, I have multiple presets for different filament size, different uh, type of plastic, different temperature, and uh, different printers, of course. And then uh, I can configure the, the setting just for this object, uh, usual things, uh, one provided by slicer, uh, layer height, infill, speed, whatever I need to do. When I save them, with a name, I can then recall them here. I have all the preset available here, so I select one. I, I want to uh, need a 175 millimeter PLA, 
and then I can st start the slicing process right from Repetier host. Uh, here is the output of slicer with all the information from the line command execution of, of, the, of the software. And then it goes, it shows me the G code. I can edit the G code here right from the interface if I want to change the temperature or whatever I want to change. Save the code. I can visualize um, layer by layer here what is happening to my object. I can follow the path. I can see uh, the complete um, object. Or I can see a range of layers from 2 to 12, or just one layer, and many other interesting things. And then I go to the print panel. I connect the printer. I can control the printer manually. do whatever I need to do, and then I can just run the G code from here. And uh, I have another screen. Uh, with this one, I can control in real time the position of the printing head, or I can monitor the temperature curve. It's a very, very nice feature. And also the power applied to the heater, so I can check how much power I'm, I'm using to do the heating. This is the purple line is the uh, desired temperature. The red uh, line is the uh, current temperature of the extruder. The blue one is the current temperature of the head. The head is not heated, so, so uh, sorry, the bed is not heated, so it's always um, room temperature. Actually, there's not even a sensor. So, um, oops, again. It's not heating. Ah, okay, because I have a different, uh, a different. Uh, sorry, I was preheating these things to save time. Um, let me reconnect again and and do a run. So it will work with a proper setting. Uh -huh. It's not heating. Okay, sorry. Oh, let's let, let reset a second both the printer and the software. OK, and now, now it's working, hopefully. We should see the temperature rising up to the right value. <coughs> Actually, it's decreasing. Uh, interesting. I don't know why. It's supposed to go to 205, it's 145, and it's going down. It's a set uh, correct for the rate, printing settings, the browser, not set. What do you mean? Uh, this hmm. is an uh, old version of the Hmm? Just like it's not hitting well. Uh, anyway, uh, believe me, usually it works. <laughs> of course, I move the printer, and so something has happened. Uh, if I if I set it by hand, if I connect it by hand, I can. Is it It's not hitting, but it's monitoring the temperature. Do you have power on? Yes, it's powered. I think so. Yes, it's powered. Uh, yes, I can uh, probably yeah. move. It was working before, but it isn't working anymore. So okay, well it now it's running actually. So and so uh, there is a, a nine uh, commands waiting. Yeah, yes, because it is, was waiting to rise temperature. You cannot send other commands before the temperature is reached. That is uh, yeah. one of limitation of the no, of this printer. This is the latest version. I installed no, it yesterday. Okay, uh, maybe I install on the other machine, but it should be the last one. This is my version. This is No, it believe me, it works usually, but uh, uh, okay, <coughs> okay. It's not uh, okay. <coughs> well, in this case, you better do a hard reset. Anyway, the, the fact is that I, d 
the goal was not to print something <coughs> now, but just to show you that you can control the printer, you can do uh, this sort of manual uh, control. Okay, now I got an answer. I can control the motors, I can move the printer. I have my G-code. I regenerate the G-code just to be sure. Okay, I have an error. Oh, because I haven't loaded the file, correct. So let's do it quickly again, uh, but smaller size. And then slice it. Okay. Very quick, as you see. Slicer is very speedy. And now I am running again the code. This is the code that is sent to the printer, line by line. I can uh, monitor the well the position of the the, the head, but there there is no uh, is still uh, not moving and is waiting, but the temperature is not going. Okay, again. Well, we will see later. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>